Thank you, thank you, Tariq. And good afternoon uh, to everyone online and in the room. And hope you had a good weekend. Uh, the number of cases in China uh, continues to decline. And yesterday, China reported 206 cases of COVID-19 to WHO. The low since uh, 22nd January. Only eight cases were reported outside Hubei province yesterday. Outside China, a total of 8,739 cases of COVID-19 have been reported to WHO from 61 countries with 127 deaths. In the last 24 hours, there were almost nine times more cases reported outside China than inside China. The epidemics in the Republic of um, uh, Korea, Italy, Iran, and Japan are our greatest concern. I would also like to inform you that a WHO team have arrived in Iran this afternoon uh, to deliver supplies and support the government in the response. I would like to use this opportunity to thank Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan of the United Arab Emirates for his support in making this mission possible. Shukran Jazilan, Crown Prince. A WHO staff member in our Iran country, of course, uh, has now tested positive for COVID-19, uh, and he has mild uh, disease. The Republic of uh, Korea has now reported more than 4,200 cases and 22 deaths, meaning it has more than half of all cases outside China. However, the cases in the Republic of Korea appear to be coming mostly from suspected cases from the five known clusters rather than the community. That's important because it indicates that surveillance measures are working and Korea's epidemic can still be contained. Knowing and understanding your epidemic is the first step to defeating it. Korea's situation also underlines that this is a unique virus with unique features. This virus is not influenza. We are in uncharted territory. We have never seen before a, resp a, res a respiratory pathogen that's capable of community transmission, but at the same time, which can also be contained with the right measures. If this was an influenza epidemic, we would have expected to see widespread community transmission across the globe by now, and efforts to slow it down or contain it would not be feasible. But containment of COVID-19 is feasible and must remain the top priority for all countries. With early aggressive measures, countries can stop transmission and save lives. We appreciate that people are debating whether this is a pandemic or not. We are monitoring the situation every moment of every day and analyzing the data. I have said it before and I will say it again. WHO will not hesitate to describe this as a pandemic if that's what the evidence suggests. But we need to see this in perspective. Of the 88,913 cases reported globally uh, so far, 90% uh, eight, are in China, mostly in one province. Of the 8,739 cases reported outside China, 81% are from four countries. Of the other 57 affected countries, 38 have reported 10 cases or less. 19 have reported only one case. 
and a good number of cases have already contained the virus and have not reported, reported in the last <coughs> two weeks. We know people are afraid. We know they have many concerns and questions. Is the virus spreading in my community? Will my kids be okay? Will my parents be okay? Is it safe to hold an event? Should I travel? The answers to these questions will vary depending on where you live, how old you are, and how healthy you are. Individuals, families, and communities should follow the advice provided by local health authorities and local health professionals. WHO will continue to provide evidence-based guidance to help countries and individuals to assess and manage their risk and make decisions. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. Different countries are in different scenarios. More than 130 countries have not detected any cases yet. Some just received their first cases yesterday. Some have clusters of cases with transmission between family members and other close contacts. Some have rapidly expanding epidemics with signs of community transmission. And some have declining epidemics and have not reported a case for more than two cases, two, two weeks. I'll repeat this. And some have declining epidemics and have not reported a case for more than two weeks. Some countries have more than one of these scenarios at the same time. For example, China had community transmission in Wuhan, but relatively small numbers of cases in other provinces. Other countries have a similar pattern. WHO is advising countries on actions they can take for each of the three CIS scenarios. First case, first cluster, first evidence of community transmission. The basic actions in each scenario are the same, but the emphasis changes depending on which scenario a country is in. Our message to all countries is this is not one-way street. We can push this virus back. Your actions now will determine the course of the outbreak in your country. There is no choice but act now. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. We will start uh, first here in the room, and then uh, we will go online. And I repeat again that we would like to have each journalist asking only one question. We will start with Shoko, please. My name is Keja, from Japan Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, the number of confirmed death cases have uh, reached 3,000. Uh, total number in the world, and the uh, coronavirus has spread now to 65 countries. Are we still in the phase where we can contain the virus? Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> your question may have been formulated be before the Director General spoke. I think he was very clear on where we are. Um, the, uh, the fact remains that for most countries, uh, the vast majority of countries, we don't have community level transmission or at least demonstrated in those countries. There is a very small number of countries in which we have demonstrated and established uh, community transmission. That's not a good situation for those countries and it's certainly not a good situation in terms of the impact on the health systems and we've seen that and the very unfortunate, regrettable and tragic deaths. Uh, but when we look at this at a global level and we look at the number of countries affected and of them the number of countries who have established community transmission, uh, we are still hopeful that containment is the, the right first strategy. But clearly containment with the purpose of slowing down the virus. And if we're lucky and if we do the job really well, we may get the opportunity. We just might get the opportunity to interrupt transmission. 
but at the very minimum, containment is allowing us to significantly slow down the spread of the virus, thereby giving an opportunity for health systems to prepare, for PPE to be made available, for training to take place, for laboratories to get uh, reagents, for laboratory laboratory technicians to be trained. So we still firmly believe that, um, that the strategy of containment with slowing down spread, with protecting the health system, is still the best combination or blend of strategies right now. Yeah, I, I would like to, to add to that. Um, in the statement um, I just uh, made, I have tried to categorize the countries and you can have a look for yourselves, by the way, um, why we say containment works. One, a good number of countries, around eight, have actually not reported cases in the past two weeks, more than two weeks, although they had cases uh, before that, they had reported, and then they were able to contain it. But in addition to that, if you see what's happening in China, um, it shows from uh, the result so far uh, that this outbreak can actually be contained even where there are many cases. Um, so it would be safe to assume that, especially in countries where they have less number of cases, it's even more possible to, to contain it. And from the 62 countries who have reported cases, 38 of them have reported 10 or less cases. Actually, 36 country, 34 countries have reported less than 10 cases, and four countries 10, so that makes it 38 less or equal to 10 countries. These countries should really invest in containment. And of course, we're also saying at the same time, even if you have more cases, it could be thousands, like, for instance, Korea or China or um, Italy, still containment is, is better. By the way, in Italy, uh, we see that the prime minister is now coordinating the whole effort, the central government and also the um, local governments are, are aligned and we can see a very clear uh, political uh, commitment and surveillance is now boosted. Of course they were surprised but they have strong institutions, they are bringing it uh, together and we have confidence in, in, in Italy and we believe that they can also contain it. So that's what we're uh, saying. Containment is possible in all countries that are affected. And that should be number one. And then, of course, the other strategies can also be applied. And that's why also we're saying the comprehensive approach is uh, very, very important. So, okay, giving the overall picture globally, like saying, okay, we are close to 90,000 and we have more than 3,000 deaths, 65 countries are affected, is fine. But at the same time, let's go down and see what's the situation in each and every country. Like what I said, out of the 62 or 65 countries, 38 are equal to or less than 10 cases. And I can give you even those with, with more than between, for instance, 14 and 130 cases, which if you take as the lowest, is only tw you have 20 countries. So if you add the 38 and 20 countries, already 58 countries are actually less than 130 cases. 58. And those more than 1,000 are only four or five countries. So that's why we're also saying one size fits all approach doesn't work. Blanket recommendation doesn't work. And each and every country should have its own risk assessment and have a tailored approach. Uh, but all countries, we believe, should start from containment strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chen, please. And then, uh, yeah. Le président chinois a réitéré aujourd'hui que la Chine va renforcer
la coopération avec d'autres pays dans les recherches de vaccins et médicaments, etc. Et euh, d'après vous, quels sont les moyens pour renforcer encore plus la coopération internationale après le forum euh, du mois dernier et euh, dans quel domaine prioritairement Merci. So the question is that uh, China has said that they will reinforce the cooperation with other countries in response to uh, COVID. So uh, what's your opinion uh, where this cooperation could be reinforced, especially in the light of a uh, uh, meeting we had a few weeks ago on research and development? I can start. And then, uh, so the, the experience that China has with COVID-19 uh, the work that they are doing and taking an evidence-based approach to this response is something that the world needs to learn from. Um, we have been communicating and working with colleagues in China from the beginning. Um, they have participated in all of our teleconferences across all of the different disciplines. They have participated in the research and development roadmap meeting that we had a few weeks ago. They're continuing to work with us. I've just returned from two weeks in China where we again discussed what they are doing in terms of building an evidence base and the world needs to learn from them. So we uh, are looking forward to continuing to collaborate with Chinese scientists and public health professionals across all of the different disciplines to better understand epidemiology and transmission to better understand what they're doing around severity and understanding treatments. There are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing in China and we are awaiting those results. We are still only eight weeks into this outbreak. There are a number of clinical trials that are ongoing and we're hoping to learn of the results of those very soon. Um, there are diagnostics in terms of molecular diagnostics and serologic assays that, are, that have been developed. There are sero surveys that are being done. There's a number of research uh, studies that are ongoing um, and we are working working closely with them to better understand what we can anticipate in terms of results coming out and how that will impact our response going forward. So this is a feedback loop. Every evidence, all the evidence that is being gathered as part of this response is fed back into the response so that we can always, always be better and take another approach. In addition, China has uh, sent a technical team to support uh, the response in Iran. Uh, and has committed to supporting countries with weaker health systems with uh, materials, supplies and uh, with teams in collaboration with WHO and, and, uh, and, and that is very much in line with what many other countries are doing so we very much uh, appreciate that. Uh, specifically at the international level now with uh, research we absolutely need the data from the clinical trials that are ongoing for the existing therapeutics, some of that in the US, some of that in, in China and we have uh, strong commitments from our Chinese collaborators on, on sharing that information as soon as possible. We are establishing a, a global data safety monitoring board so we can create a centralized way of pooling data. We're working with the NIH in the US, with the European and other institutions in China on a master protocol for clinical trials and for serology studies that will allow us to create common endpoints, common data sets that will allow us to add value and power to the data we're collecting and get answers for the world. So the outcome of the meeting a month ago I think is now accelerating this collective approach, a standardized approach, but we really do need a, a and I believe they're coming on stream now, but standardized reliable serology testing is something we, we absolutely need at this point. Um, and uh, we've just come out of a scientific advisory group meeting this morning with the group for the R&D blueprint. They're currently meeting as we speak and they're discussing the super priorities like and accelerating these specific aspects of the research in the coming days. Thank you very much, uh, Badia, please. Badia, from 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 yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Apart from the, Dr. Tedros, it is regarding the mission that you sent to Iran. Apart from the flight restrictions to Iran, were, were there any other difficulties that um, the mission of uh, facing, for instance, you know, to help Iran to tackle the coronavirus, does the uh, sanctions imposed against Iran? affect the WHO mission. Mm -hmm. um, the DG may supplement, but certainly the team didn't just arrive today. The team arrived with uh, 
capacity uh, and reagents and supplies for over 100,000 100, diagnostic tests and with PPE that will supply over uh, 15,000 health workers. So uh, the team hasn't arrived uh, without supplies. Um, clearly the, the recent announcements on the easing of sanctions regarding med medicinal medical products and supplies is something that we're, we're very happy and hopeful will, will continue. Uh, certainly uh, uh, the health system in Iran needs to be supported. It is a very strong health system historically very strong, uh, has a proud history of responding to disasters like earthquakes. But clearly all health systems come under pressure from this disease and we've seen that at a global level. It doesn't matter what country you're in, this disease will stretch your health system and therefore uh, we fully support further support to Iran's medical system in order that Iran may contain this disease because containing this disease in Iran not only helps Iran, it helps the world. I, I think Mike, Mike had already said it. I uh, would like to uh, comment actually the statement from the United States in support of uh, Iran. Uh, I think we have a common enemy now and using health and especially fighting this virus as a bridge for peace is, is very, very important. And UAE's support um, is also another example of solidarity, which we have been calling for uh, some time now. And this is very encouraging. And uh, we would like to actually uh, thank the two countries, but at the same time call on, um, you know, stressing the importance of uh, solidarity at this time. Uh, this virus, this enemy is unknown. Uh, there are something known now, but many unknowns, and it's a common enemy. And we have to stand together in unison to, to, to fight it. And these early signs are very encouraging. And as humanity, we should stand together. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will go online uh, for a couple of questions from journalists uh, watching us. We will start with National Geographic, and sorry if I mispronounce the name, uh, Sikan Akpan. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. was actually right on the mark in terms of my name, so thank you. I appreciate that. Well, my, my, question is <laughs> my question is about the clinical attack rate. I was wondering if you have an estimate for the clinical attack rate uh, for Wuhan, for Hubei province, or for China as a whole? I'm looking at my cheat sheet. So, yes, yeah, so as, as you know, we, we've just come back from um, two weeks in, in China, and the, the internet, I was there two weeks, but the international mission was there for nine days, and we've just published a very detailed report on the, the WHO website, and it's in English, and in, and in Chinese, it will be in the National Health Commission's website in China. Um, so I do encourage you to read that in full. Um, there's a lot of detail in there around um, what we've learned about transmission. Um, what we've seen in terms of attack rates, um, much has been published by the China CDC. Um, there was a paper that came out in the China CDC weekly looking at attack rates uh, by age. Um, and we do see varying uh, levels of attack rates by age. I'm not going to quote what, th what the percentage is from, from that paper. Um, but we did see some, some variation in terms of attack rates. For example, we saw low attack rates in children. Um, and, and that was something uh, that is something that is important and warrants some further study. Um, we do see uh, uh, higher attack rates in adults. Um, and what we've seen there is that transmission is occurring amongst close contacts. And that is something that has been confirmed through the data uh, that we've, we've seen in China. And that transmission is being driven by um, um, close contacts r between families. Um, and so what we've seen is higher attack rates in adults than we've seen in children. In terms of quantifying that specifically, it's still quite early days in terms of what we know. Uh, what we're finding are symptomatic contacts because this is what surveillance is focused on. What we need now are population-based serologic surveys. And so these are looking at an age stratified, uh, looking at all different ages across 
um, in the general community to really better understand what infection looks like at different age groups. This is being conducted now. These zero surveys are starting to be conducted now, and we hope to have results. We hope to see some preliminary results of these in the coming weeks, and maybe maybe a few weeks before we actually get those, and then we will be able to determine what kind of attack rates we're seeing by age. But right now, we can say higher attack rates in adults, clinical attack rates in adults versus children. And just to add the, 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 the operative word here, been a clinical attack rate, because obviously without a serology test, you, you can't tell how many people are actually overall being uh, in, in infected. Um, but uh, colleagues in Korea and other places, as well as in China, uh, certainly in family situations, the secondary attack rate within a family is lower than we would have expected in, the, in, a, in a respiratory, with a respiratory pathogen. And the same amongst contacts. Uh, the number of contacts followed up now in China is in, the, is in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And again, the attack rate in that group is 1 to 5 percent and 5 to 10 percent, I think, in family contacts. Um, and, and they are relatively low uh, in, in that sense. And similar observations are now emerging in Korea and South Korea and Republic of Korea. So uh, again, uh, all of this is easy to say, but with, as, as, as Maria said, without a validated serology test, there will always be the doubt that there is a, a, a larger proportion of um, subclinical or non-detected non infection going on at community level. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Kai Kupferschmidt uh, from Science. Kai, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes, sorry, thanks a lot. So, um, yeah, I did actually read the report, and, and I'm curious because the, the report basically makes the point that China managed with, it, with its very extreme measures to, to beat back, um, you know, this quite sizable epidemic in, in Wuhan. So the, the question for me is what does it mean for the other countries that find themselves at the start of this? Because, you know, not every country will be able to implement these extreme measures, and the question to me is at what point do you recommend you know, some of these measures being implemented. When you have a place where you have a few dozen cases, we know that that's, you know, a picture of what it was like a week ago, maybe. So I'm curious what your recommendations are. Okay. Uh, I, I think you need to look at the experience uh, inside uh, Hubei and the experience in the other 31 provincial municipality city regions uh, and, and administrative regions. Uh, the measures certainly uh, that were uh, taken in Hubei were extremely aggressive, very, very strong uh, in the face of a massive uh, thousands of cases per day, if you cast your mind back, thousands of cases per day. If you look at the experience in the other uh, provinces, the experience in the other provinces is probably more akin to what some countries are experiencing now outside. And the measures that were put in place in those other provinces in China are nowhere close to as stringent as what was put in place in Hubei. So I think we need to, again, when we look at China, is not look at a country that's implemented the same measures everywhere. The measures have been very graduated against to what was perceived as the transmission dynamics at any given time. And those measures have changed over time and have been adapted to each provincial need. So I think uh, matching those measures, but certainly uh, it is clear in the likes of Singapore, for example, if you take another example outside in, in Hong Kong, that measures that have not involved um, uh, walling off cities or completely banning travel have been very effective in both suppressing and, and driving transmission down uh, over the last uh, six weeks. So I don't think we're talking necessarily about measures uh, at the Hubei level um, because, quite frankly, other countries may not be capable in terms of their levels of social acceptance or resources to be able to sustain that type of effort for so long. That's a real question mark in, in, in our minds. But those measures don't necessarily have to be as uh, aggressive or as robust. Uh, and Maria may wish to comment on your observations in, in Guangdong and, and in Sichuan and other places. The point Mike is making about um, this approach that has been uh, different in di based on the intensity of transmission is, is true. And, you know, what we've seen in China and what we're seeing in other countries, it's not just China, it's all, it's all countries that, are, that have been able to slow down this virus. And there are examples of countries outside of China that have been able to slow this virus. They're really applying these fundamental principles of public health. Um, these are public health measures at, at the core. 
you know, and this involves identifying cases, you know, aggressively. You know, the earlier and the, and the more action that takes place early on as cases are identified in countries, the better outcome you're going to have in your country. Um, finding those cases, finding those contacts, following and managing them over the incubation period, um, making sure that you, you pri provide the right provisions to those individuals who are in hospital, providing adequate care, um, having social distancing, practicing hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, these things work. Um, there have been some movement restrictions, but as Mike has said, um, and as we have seen in Wuhan, there's been some you know, very extreme use of these for temporary periods of time. Um, but we are seeing that these have been successful, and other countries can do this. All countries are able right now to talk to their communities. All of them are able to tell their, their, the population what they can do and what they should avoid. All hospitals can get ready. That is something that can be applied across, across the globe. All countries can be looking for cases right now. All countries can be aggressively finding those first cases and following those contacts over time. And we can all help each other and look out for each other. Um, so there's a lot of fundamental things that were done in China that can be done anywhere. Thank you very much. The next question uh, is from Sarah from DevEx. Sarah, can you hear us? Hear us? Yes, thank you. Um, in Dr. Ted's remarks, I think it was mentioned that there's been a respiratory virus capable of community transmission. Um, could you clarify what that means? Is the flu not capable of community transmission? And what are the implications of a respiratory virus capable of community transmission? Mm -hmm. No, uh, I think you, you have to include the second part. It's um, capable of uh, community transmission, but at the same time, it can be contained, the corona. But if you're talking about another respiratory infection like um, flu, then it will not be, you know, we're not able to contain it actually. So that's the contrast. That's what I meant uh, to say. But uh, if uh, Mike or uh, Maria, if you want to add. Yeah. I think with many respiratory pathogens, and we ex especially respiratory viral pathogens, we experience them every winter, uh, we don't necessarily attempt to contain or stop them because we fundamentally believe they will spread unabated. We try to protect ourselves from that individual infection, but we don't have a principle of trying to stop the infection at a societal global level. You don't see uh, restrictions or any measures put in place with seasonal influenza. Yes, we want to protect individuals from seasonal influenza by vaccination or avoiding infection, uh, but we don't implement specific measures at airports or we don't have uh, thermal screening or any of those things because we have a, a disease for which we have a vaccine, we have treatments, we understand its trans transmission dynamics, we understand its patterns. Here we have a disease for which we have no vaccine, no treatment, we don't fully understand transmission, we don't fully understand case fatality. But what we have been uh, genuinely uh, heartened by is that unlike influenza, where countries have fought back, where they've put in place strong measures, we've remarkably seen that the virus is suppressed. Uh, or at least the clinical appearance of the virus, the number of clinically apparent cases has been greatly suppressed. Um, and the, the hope in that is that this virus is, and the DG said it in his speech, it's not influenza and it's not behaving like influenza. It is behaving like COVID-19. The problem is we don't know exactly uh, how COVID-19 behaves, but we know uh, it's uh, not transmitting in exactly the same way that influenza was, and that offers us a glimmer, a chink of light that this virus can be suppressed and pushed and contained. Uh, and at the very least, by doing that, we give all the health systems in the world a chance to prepare and potentially develop therapeutics and vaccines to prevent it. This is about containment and buying time. Um, and in doing that, we can, um, we can save a lot of lives. And if I could just add to that, to what the DG said in his speech about these three C's, you have cases, clusters, communities. What everyone expects is that you go from cases, you go to clusters, you go to communities, and that's it. What we are actually seeing is that we're seeing community transmission in some countries actually bring this back down to seeing clusters again. And that is something that we need to learn from and we are learning from. And that is the hope. 
that is where we can see that you can drive this down. You can bring it back. There is no eventuality here. We're planning for every type of scenario in every type of country. But just because you have clusters of cases doesn't mean you can bring that down to individual cases. Just because you have community transmission doesn't mean that you can't bring that back down to clusters that you can follow. And I think that's really important. We are seeing positives here. We are seeing declines in cases. We're learning from that. That's why we're up here every day talking to you, being so aggressive in our language of saying the time is to act now. The time is to act early. The time Time is to be aggressive. The earlier you act, the better chances you're going to have, and all of that buys us time. As Mike has just said, this all buys us time to better prepare our systems, our hospitals, the development of medical interventions, vaccines. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question from online, then we will have a time for two more questions here in the room. Uh, 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 Ms. Banjo Kaur from uh, India, from Down to Earth, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Hello? Hello. Okay. Yes, so, yes. Uh, Mike, you said you gave a very detailed statement the other day differentiating between mitigation and containment. Uh, Dr. Tedros, you also said today that all countries are capable of containing the virus. Uh, the European CDC in a statement issued today has said that in the event of established and widespread community transmission, current containment measures may no longer be effective. And to, to have efficient use of resources, we have to move into the mitigation phase. So they are saying that containment is not possible in their jurisdiction. Uh, I would request you to comment on that. My second question is, Dr. Tedros, you were saying that, uh, you know, the countries should ask themselves. And Joe, we said one question, have, please. Just, 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 just quickly, quickly, quick question. Okay. Mm -hmm. That we should have enough ventilators and enough oxygen, etc., vital equipment to ensure that, you know, we are able to provide good care. Can you define for, for, for us what is that enough? Because what is enough for a big country like India or for, for, for a country like Finland may not be enough for a big country like India. If not in numbers, if you could just elaborate, what is that enough for us? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, on the issue, I don't believe the U.S. Uh, have made the ECDC, ECDC, ECDC or anyone. I'm yeah. oh, sorry, have made European CDC. Okay. Oh, European CDC. I believe uh, everyone's still very much committed to containment. I would hate to think that countries in Europe who currently have no cases uh, are now moving to mitigation and they would be uh, find that quite difficult to explain to the citizens right now. Uh, so I do believe that uh, when we speak at a regional level, it's very important that uh, we're not saying that containment has no place in this. And I, I would like, I, we can see the statement and see what it says. Um, there is a point in any uh, epidemic uh, where you believe you can no longer uh, contain the virus, or like it, if it was influenza, and you're, you have to shift your resources to saving lives. But in doing that, you're accepting that you can no longer affect the course of the disease. Um, you can no longer change the shape of the epidemic. And you're purely move, moving in that sense to save as many lives as you can. Now, WHO does not believe that we're there yet, based on what the, the Director General has presented to you today. We can have that argument. We can sit around the coffee tables all week long and for the next month, and we can talk about who's right and we can talk about who's wrong. Or we can get on with it. That's the, that's the question. History will tell who was right or who was wrong. The real question is we can't miss this opportunity to save lives and we can't miss this opportunity to protect our health systems. So let's just get on with it. Yeah. And um, earlier I, I have been saying 38 countries, uh, 10 or less cases. And if you take 11 to 100 cases, you have additional 17 countries. So 17 plus 38, 55 out of 62, with less than 100 cases. And <laughs> I think the figures can <laughs> show us what kind of um, strategy actually countries should, should follow, that they should start from containment. And the number of cases, uh, countries reporting more than 1,000 cases, four countries. And we're saying even those countries, 
should actually, in their comprehensive package, they should include containment. And moving from containment to mitigation without testing the containment itself in all those countries, I don't think is a wise uh, decision. Uh, even with more cases, more, more than 1,000, having a comprehensive approach is much better than having, you know, this um, a, a strategy which moves into mitigation, uh, which t to us, and w uh, this is, I hope, uh, is, is, is clear, um, surrendering, I don't think is, is, is right. So we have to give it our best using containment strategy, irrespective of the number of uh, cases. But this doesn't mean that we will not monitor the situation on a regular basis. We will. And we will adjust our strategies based on that. But in terms of strategy, still, whatever the announcement would be, whether it's pandemic or not, we will still go for a comprehensive approach, but in the strategy, the combination of strategies could, could vary based on the uh, situation. So that's what we're, uh, we're, we're saying. And uh, this is coming from a, a proper analysis of what has happened in the last two to three months after the announcement or the declaration of this uh, outbreak where we have seen success with containment strategy and which we believe that it's worthwhile to continue with that kind of uh, strategy. There was a question on ventilators. Yeah. Bria. Yeah, so, so this, this, the question about um, preparing hospitals for respiratory support and ventilators and oxygen is, is a good one. Um, this is something that all countries need to, to be doing some assessments of um, in terms of what would be needed um, should they start to see cases. Um, we do know in terms of the severity spectrum, we do know that it excuse me, 80% of those that are infected will have mild disease and recover. We do know that there's a, approximately 15% that will have severe and another 4 or 5% that will be critical, which will require, which will require oxygen support. Um, so there are some estimates that are coming from the, the laboratory, excuse me, the clinical teleconferences, um, which would give some indication of 30, 40% of people who are hospitalized that would need oxygen support. And those types of, those types of percentages are preliminary those types of percentages need to be more refined so that so that people can prepare for that um, and then you need to take that into an assessment of what would be required within your country based on your population based on the demographics and the underlying conditions in, in your in your countries but just remember most countries even even sophisticated health systems have very limited intensive care capacity as an overall proportion of the number of clinical beds that they have so this is, uh, this is not just an issue for uh, the South or for weaker health systems. Uh, the, the careful planning and use of intensive care beds is, uh, is, is not a straightforward process. And the idea of just having, uh, having ventilators, for example, needs uh, trained technicians. Uh, ECMO and extracorporeal oxygenation is a process that requires very high levels of skill. It's not just the equipment. So I do think that uh, countries need to focus on basic levels of care, basic uh, support to patients early in the course of the disease so that they don't develop the more severe forms of the disease, early use of oxygen to support people, because most countries will struggle if they start to see large numbers of patients requiring intensive care. Uh, it's not a straightforward nor an easy process, and we've also seen that people are spending many, many, many days, up to 20, 24 days, in a critical care environment. Uh, that's occupying a lot of beds for a very long time. So I think uh, all countries are going to have to think very carefully about how they manage the critical care component of this, uh, of this disease. Thank you very much. We will come back to the room. Body and then Gabriela. Good evening. From Hong Kong. So just to follow up on my colleague from India, uh, some countries probably in Europe has uh, underestimated the, uh, this epidemic and no transparency and 
probable um, ignored warnings to public. Do you have any comments on this? Um, and, 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 and I'm sorry. And now has uh, with uh, mild discrimination against the Iranian or against mm -hmm. the Italian. Please give, give us uh, some comments. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think we've all been on that merry ground once before. We're not in the business of apportioning blame uh, to countries nor to individual ethnic groups. Uh, all countries who've experienced this disease have been unfortunate victims of being in the pathway of the disease. Um, what Maria said before and the DG said before is we, we, we don't believe that countries are being non-transparent. There's an issue in, in the beginning of any outbreak when something starts. It's very hard sometimes to distinguish that from all of the other background of winter influenza and other things. Um, and sometimes it's difficult to pick up that signal of what's happening. Uh, um, uh, I've, I've said it and written, written it myself in the past, and I've uh, done many, many outbreak responses. It's very easy to get caught unawares in an epidemic situation. It's very easy to get behind the curve, to get behind on the back foot. And that happens almost invariably. It almost is a rule of epidemic response. The real question is how quickly you catch up. Do you realize the situation you're in and can you catch up quickly? And what we're seeing is countries catching up quickly now. Countries really beginning to understand what they're fighting and beginning to take concrete actions towards doing that. We want to push, promote, and support those countries who wish to take aggressive, concrete action to control this disease, not to start criticizing, apportioning blame, or doing all of the other negative things that help nobody. It helps nobody uh, to do that. And particularly when it comes to ethnic profiling of people, it's not only unhelpful, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's abhorrent, and we reject it entirely. Um, uh, and the DG has been saying this, solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. Uh, we can always... After this outbreak is over, we can sit down and we can see where, where did we go wrong? Where do, could we do things better? Where can we increase transparency? Where can we improve systems? Where can we improve all the things we know now we would love to have stronger? But there's no point looking for something you don't have. You've got to build it now, make it work. And then we'll come back and see what we're prepared to invest in future. Uh, and it is. The Director General has said it. We spend quantums more thousands, millions times more preparing for every type of other security challenge except a public health one. And we may be paying a heavy price for, our ign for ignoring preparedness as one of the central measures of human security on this planet. I hope we don't pay too heavy a price for that, but we will certainly learn the lessons and hopefully we've learned our lesson this time. Yeah. Maybe to, to add, to, add the, to that, to be honest, it's so painful to see the level of stigma we're, we're observing. Uh, of course, <laughs> we're human beings, we're not angels. We make mistakes. But at the same time, we can make rational decisions too. And we can have the right attitude and behavior. And that's what we're calling for. We cannot be angels, but we can be rational human beings who can do the right things and avoid the wrong things. I remember uh, once, this is a long time ago, <laughs> I was very, very young actually, um, and there was a lot of destabilization in the world and somebody was asking a question. When do human beings stand as one, was a question. And another one is responding, this is in school. When we have a common enemy from another planet, why do we need another enemy from another planet to be one? When we have in the same planet a common enemy that could affect us all equally. So that's what we're saying. There is a common enemy in this planet itself where we need to fight in unison. And the stigma, to be honest, is more dangerous than the virus itself. And let's really underline that. A stigma is the most dangerous enemy. For me, it's more than the virus itself.
I guess uh, we'll take a Gabriella, and then probably we'll have to conclude, Jamie. There will be another day. Shane, too. Thank you, Tarek, for taking my question. Gabriela Sotomayor, Mexico, Proceso. Um, Dr. Tedros, uh, as you may know, and you know, uh, COVID-19 just arrived in Mexico. Uh, we have five imported cases now, uh, but people are a bit skeptical with a layback attitude. Some, some say it's a light disease. They don't understand why so much exaggeration, isolation, containment. So they say that people die, more people die from influenza in the world. So I understand that fear is not an option, but the other extreme is not the solution either. And I know that you have been repeating and repeating the same message, but what can you say to, to them? And just quick question, and what about North Korea? We, we don't have, do you, are you in contact with the health authorities? Thank you. Yeah, we are in touch yeah, we are. with the uh, health authorities in North Korea with our office uh, there and uh, have had multiple meetings here in Geneva with representatives of North Korea and we've sent equipment, supplies and diagnostic equipment to the North and again subject to the same release and uh, uh, on sanctions and under the proper um, resolutions. Uh, we, um, and we know that uh, DPRK has stepped up its preparedness procedures. We're not aware of any cases uh, there right now, I don't think, no. And, um, and we're certainly ready to uh, both strengthen our country office in, uh, and send teams uh, as needed. And I know that uh, North Korea is also in contact with the South and also in contact uh, with uh, Chinese colleagues and officials uh, as well. Um, the DG will speak to the issue of uh, what you, you mentioned regarding um, uh, this outbreak uh, or this epidemic being like flu or not like flu or whatever. It, it's, a, it's a difficult position for uh, any individual or organization or anyone to be in because if you say we have a disease for which we don't know the full transmission dynamics, uh, for which on the face of it has a case fatality of 2% or possibly more in certain circumstances, where up to in some cases 10% of people with underlying conditions can die who, who, who are present clinically, then if someone is trying to tell me we shouldn't be trying to stop that, we should just uh, accept that as normal business, then um, I don't know why I'm doing this job, frankly. Um, uh, having said that, we have to be very careful. And te Dr. Tedros has been very careful since the beginning of this event. We have tried at every possible opportunity to say to people, we, need, we don't know, we're hoping, we, we, we've said it today, only 80,000 cases, only so many thousand deaths around the world. We're not the ones trying to scaremonger here. We're trying to be realistic, we're trying to be balanced, we're trying to get across the right message, we're trying to tell people what they can do. Uh, I'll ask you and others, what are you doing to, to balance that message on the international front? What, what's your responsibility in this, uh, in doing that? Uh, and, uh, and if we can all answer that question and go to sleep at night, then we will be better. <laughs> but I do think that we have been trying to be balanced, as many of you have been balanced in this. Uh, China has gone through a huge uh, punch to its system. This isn't just a, a small little thing that passed over China. This has been a massive punch to the economy, uh, to the social system, and to the health system in China. We don't want the rest of the world to have to absorb that punch, and we're trying to do our best to avoid that. And as Dr. Tedros said, we may not be able to, but we at the same time can prepare, can get ready. We can spread this disease out over a longer period. We can reduce the impact on the health system and the capacity of the health system to absorb that and make this less impactful on society and on communities. Um, and uh, we hope we can communicate the right level of risk. We've said it again and again. Society should go on. Communities should continue to work and thrive. Uh, we don't necessarily need the kinds of measures that have been put in place in Hubei because we're not there yet in most countries. The simplest and most straightforward of public health measures in countries, if applied aggressively and persistently over time, have shown in many countries that the disease can be brought under control. Uh, and, and if we can apply those minimum measures for the maximum time, I think we'll make progress. Uh, I, I just hope we're not uh, uh, scaring people unnecessarily. That is certainly not our intention. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we have been saying repeatedly, Mike had said it already, is 
fear and panic are dangerous, very, very dangerous. Concerns and worries are understandable. And what we are saying is, it's fine to be concerned and worried, but let's calm down and do the right things. That's our message. That has been our message. And from the start, when the number of cases in the rest of the world was so small, it was less than 100 when we declared public health emergency of international concern, you remember. And it was actually a day, two days after we have seen human-to-human -human transmission that we declared public health emergency of international concern. Less than 100 cases in the rest of the world, and no deaths actually. And we had window of opportunity. And what we said then was, let's, of course we can have concerns and worries, it's understandable, but let's really calm down and do the right things and use the window of opportunity to contain this outbreak. So still the same message, but in some places we're not seeing the level of uh, response that we expected, and that's why we have been again um, <laughs> saying to the world, or reminding to the world that the window of opportunity is narrowing, and that we have to still do our best uh, to catch up. So still, the same message, comprehensive approach. Of course, we can have concerns and worries, but calm down and do the right things. And there are positive signals. We're not saying this without any reason or facts. I cannot say calm down without seeing any uh, good uh, uh, reason. The good reason is there are successes already in some countries where they have already contained the virus. And I said it, 55 countries, less than 100 cases. I leave the question to you. Can, can't that be contained? But we're saying not even less than 100 cases, even if it's more, it can be contained. And we have seen already examples starting from China. So the question now is how hard can we continue to hit it? How committed are we to really hit hard? That's, that's the question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. Thanks to everyone here in the room and everyone watching us. Uh, I'm sorry for all those in the room, but also online who have not been uh, able to ask their question, but uh, we will see each other again. Uh, audio file will be available immediately and transcript hopefully tomorrow. Have a nice evening. Okay, see you tomorrow.